We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm super excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Charles Watkins. He is an equity partner, chief diversity officer, and co-chair of the first party practice group at Kubicki Draper. Charles, it's good to see you. If you want to share a little bit uh, more about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to be here too and i um, honored actually. Um, uh, I am, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, what did I want to do when I grew up? Um, I, I, I took two paths really, because I was very involved with sports as a young man. I, you know, did track and field. I also did played a lot of soccer and did a bunch of other things as well as, you know, my dad, was a lawyer and and a judge and i saw what he did and i had like zero interest in doing that <laughs> so i really wanted to to pursue a, a business career um, um and you know I, when i got out of, of 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 high school i realized that i probably was a decent athlete but I was not good enough to kind of get to the professional ranks. So I, I started to lose interest in that. Um, and I, you know, went, went off to college and, and pursued a business career. I was uh, interested in marketing and I was also interested in, in just, uh, you know, um, uh, pursuing um, advertising and being a copywriter. Um, uh, I, I then, did a master's degree and I ended up um, in a in a uh, insurance company working with huge complex claims with lawyers every day. And I got a whole different picture of what it means to be a lawyer. So I said, you know what, I can do this. And I went back and uh, got my law degree. So I'm a lawyer. So and I don't know if that answers your question. I wanted to be, you know, my, my heroes when I was a kid was Pele and uh, Muhammad Ali. I would, had no interest in boxing, but I wanted to, to, to play soccer. That went away. So then I pursued business, which then landed me back where I didn't want to be, which is a lawyer. <laughs> I love that. No, it definitely answers the, the question. And it, I think it's helpful context to understand, you know, when you were younger, you didn't say you wanted to be um, a lawyer, a chief diversity officer, or an equity partner, just understanding the different paths that take us where we are today. I always also like to ask too your personal why or how your journey has really led you to be at Kubicki Draper and also kind of the many different hats as we were talking about earlier that you wear um, at the company as well. Well, um, I kind of started in on that already by telling you that I was with uh, a, an insurance company and then became a lawyer. Um, I practice as an insurance, I have an insurance defense practice, right? So I, I, I discovered my way, I found my path through that. Um, and then when I you know, became an attorney, I just kind of moved from the insurance side into the legal side. So that's how I ended up at Kabiki Draper. Um, but to become the chief diversity officer, that was more of a journey. And I mean, it, it takes me back maybe 15 years or, or more where I became involved with trade organizations like the CLM or the DRI. Um, and uh, you know, through those organizations, they promoted um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, those types of things. And I was very much interested in that. So um, I started to get on involved in various committees until I became chair of some of those committees. Uh, and then that just kind of put me in the role at you know at my firm 
Um, I was involved with helping to grow the firm too. And in doing so, you know, we always had a, a, a culture, I thought, of inclusion, um, but it was not really codified per se. And if you don't have it codified, then things can change depending on who, who takes over, right? So in my role as chief diversity officer, one of the first things that we did was we codified what we wanted as a, as a firm, which really was to just establish who we were um, as a permanent thing. And then I just have just been kind of running with it since. Yeah, I definitely agree that you need to have that alignment between codifying what you mean by an inclusive culture, what behavior is celebrated, what behavior is discouraged as well, and making sure everybody's on the same page. And I have questions about that as well, but I want to kind of shift to a broader question around that company culture. I think diversity is really part of this as well, and everybody has an ownership mentality or should around kind of the company um, and the organization that they want to work at too. From your perspective, with all the changes happening in, in the workplace, positive company culture is something that um, a lot of folks are looking for as well, and people have options. Do you think that the easiest way to improve company culture is really to remove those workplace issues or barriers? Uh, why or why not? Um, you know, when you say remove workplace issues, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, the the diversity space um, and that whole issue is really something that is not like done overnight. It's a journey, all right? Um, so when the question is to remove workplace issues, you're never going to remove workplace issues, number one. And number two, um, it's really more about how you deal with those issues. You know, what is taboo behavior? What is encouraged behavior? And, 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 and in three words, what we do here and what we try to encourage all the time with everybody, top down, in the middle, everywhere, is um, uh, what Aretha Franklin said a long time ago, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? Respect, number yeah. one. Number two, uh, encourage belonging. And number three, create opportunities for folks, right? Because when you're in the when you're in the workspace, uh, most people want an opportunity to be their best selves, to go as far as they can go, to do as well as they can as they can do. So those three things we find as you know the pillars really of 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 diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just to make the place successful, right? So that's what we do. Yeah, I think it's definitely important to have pillars, kind of the North Star of what you are following too. And you're right, change uh, does not happen overnight. And you really need to invest kind of the time, money, and resources, understand where you are today. Definitely a journey for individuals and a company at large as well. Where would you say, you know, Kubicki Draper is in the equity journey right now? And where would you like to be ideally, aspirationally a year from now? Um. You know, uh, we've taken significant steps uh, to create an atmosphere where folks can feel comfortable. Um, you know, I like, again, pushing respect, belonging, and opportunity. Um, like I said before, the framework was always really there, and it was started by our founder, Gene Kobiki, right? He was a guy that was, um, I guess, before his time. Uh, you know, the firm started in 1963, so we're on the cusp of being 60 years old. And I mean, when I joined the firm, oh, in 1993, I think we had like 35 or 36 attorneys. We have well over 200 now. Um, and back at that time, I think we had I want to say four or five female attorneys, which in the insurance uh, defense space 
back at that time, that was phenomenal. I, I must say right now, 54% of our attorneys are women, okay, 54%. Um, but even then, when it was only five or so women, one of the women was uh, a named partner in, in the firm. So that made us different. Additionally, there was always an atmosphere of what do you bring to the firm? And in so doing, how can we help you to be successful and at the same time making the firm successful? It was never about your race, your gender, you know, um, uh, your uh, preferences uh, uh, and those types of things. It was just, it was always about how can you be successful and make the firm successful, right? Um, that was really the emphasis. Um, so it, it made it made this place a special place because if you wanted to jump in, if you wanted to take advantage of an opportunity, there was always a place here for you as long as you know you were willing to work hard. So um, uh, that that's where we came from. Uh, where we want to be a year from now, I would say is, you know, I want to see more opportunity created. I want to see more, um, uh, we bring in uh, more uh, dynamic, diverse people. And we also um, do things to promote the ones that we, we currently have, right? So, that's what I would I would like to see as my mission or a goal for um, the future. Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. And having that mutual conversation of kind of the growth and development, and also contributing to the firm as well, and definitely important to have leaders from the beginning really value the the team as well, um, and really model that behavior too. I think people can can sense that as well that authenticity in kind of the many projects that you are working on on a day-to-day -day basis and the many right. different kind of directions that you're pulled or the same direction, just a lot of uh, different moving pieces here as well. What would you say your kind of current mission or, you know, really goal is common thread here? Um, it, you know, I, 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 I kind of touched on it before. Uh, I think acquire more diverse talent, right? Um, that, that, that's, First of all, as a, as a law firm, we always want to have as many dynamic people as we can get, right? Because, you know, like I tell my friends all the time, we don't make anything. You know, all we do in law firms is we talk and we write. That's it. <laughs> so... You got to talk and you have to write and you have to develop relationships with your clients um, uh, to, to such an extent that, you know, they feel uh, nourished. They feel that you're nurturing them, that they feel like you care about, about their cases and so on. And we want attorneys who do that and do that well, right? Uh, so... That's what we're looking for, and we don't really care um, whether uh, you know the, the you know the person is a woman, a man. Uh, uh, what what's your sexual orientation? None of those things. What we care about is you know are they interested in the work that that we're gonna give them? You know, um, do they do they want to grasp? opportunity and run with it right um and you know will they make us better by developing uh relationships with with our clients and and whoever is game for that that's what we want and and we you know we want them to feel uh that they can be their authentic selves here and you know that's that's what we encourage when we're talking about that encouragement, grasping opportunities, offering opportunities, raising our hand to kind of be part of a variety of projects, I want to talk about that measurement piece and how you know that you are 
doing a good job. People like progress. Again, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's important what we do day to day, annually, um, to ensure that we are, we're working towards being that aspirational state and we're cultivating that too. What are any kind of current annual, quarterly, or other time frame to key performance indicators for kind of the goals that we talked about and the overall philosophy of, you know, that respect that we um, have been discussing too? Well, we, we have annual performance reviews, self-evaluations for um, firm leadership, it, and that includes the uh, goal setting and accomplishments uh, for each division and department, as well as being involved in internal and external DEI uh, related activities. Uh, Bi-weekly uh, uh, DEI leadership meetings to review our progress towards annual objectives. Uh, we have a monthly open DEI committee meetings, all right, to kind of make sure we involve the rest of the DEI committee. And by the way, the committees are involved, uh, include uh, equity partners, uh, uh, regular um, associate attorneys, um, shareholder attorneys, as well as staff, right? So that way we try to make sure that all the voices kind of come to that DEI table. So that's one of the things that we do. We also have a, a new attorney mentorship program, um, which kind of, you know, creates the belonging, gives people an ear in which they can ask questions outside of their immediate supervisor. So, you know, I th that has been very successful to the point where uh, when we're hiring and the hiring manager, some of the attorneys were interviewing mention the mentorship program and that they're impressed with it. So, you know, um, makes us feel good that, that at least the program seems to be working. So those are just some things that we do. Yeah, I think those are really good examples as well. And, and the one that you shared too around psychological safety, offering multiple ways for people to feel comfortable giving them feedback, whether it's internal, external, and sharing those experiences and then demonstrating that you're actively listening by having trainings around these specific kind of feedback that you received for microaggressions, meeting people where they are with mentorship. Uh, and it sounds like just really kind of having that holistic strategy is really important. Has there been any other kind of feedback that you've received from lawyers about any piece of the strategy that was uh, surprising or any common patterns in, in the feedback in whatever kind of way it was it was given? Um, not really, but I mean, we're, we're, we're looking at doing some things around um, cultural competence and maybe the importance of allyship. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're, we're, we're looking at. Yeah, um, you know, the attorneys, like I said before, have uh, not really mentioned anything specific other than the microaggression thing. Um, and again, the focus of that was uh, from the feedback we got was more external rather than, than internal. Staff and attorneys mentioned that. Absolutely. Charles, I want to open it back up to a kind of a more broad question before we close out our time together and pass the mic back to you to see if there's anything I didn't directly ask that you would like to share with folks listening or underscoring any key takeaways uh, that you hope listeners kind of bring with them after hearing our conversation today. Yeah, look, I mean, I, mean, I want to emphasize again that, you know, um, uh, the, within the DEI space, it's really a journey. Um, it's not a, it's not like a destination type thing. So you have to be constantly working on it as, uh, you know, our society's norms and, and values change and, and you're dealing with people like, for instance, um, you know, we're kind of coming out of the pandemic now, right? And obviously before uh, it was, you know, 
people come into work. Now, you know, we're dealing with, uh, you know, some people want to come into work, some want to work hybrid, some don't want to come in at all, right? Um, and in order to uh, keep good talent, you have to develop a certain amount of flexibility, right? Obviously, you know, you have to have production. You have to have people being responsible for, you know, their, their jobs and so on. But at the same time, what that creates now, because you don't have people together all the time, you know, you want to develop who you are um, in your bones. What's your culture? And this is what this conversation is about, right? And it becomes very difficult if you have key people um, who are never in the office. And, and you know, I think that it is difficult to develop and nurture the culture of a firm, of a business, if people are not around each other for any period of time at all, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, we're about saying everybody's got to come in because that's not true. You know, we're about flexibility. But, you know, uh, like I told one person um, who is a leader, I said, you know, you cannot lead in absentia. If you're never around, you know, emails and, and, and phone calls and, and, and Zoom is, is not good enough. It doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't create those bonds where people feel like this person cares about me. This person wants to see my progress happen. This person understands who I am in the workplace. So there, there needs to be a fine, it's a, it's, it's a fine line to walk, but there needs to be kind of uh, both of those things. You have to have enough interaction, especially if you're in leadership with your folks, that they know you, they trust you, they believe in you, they want to follow you, um, uh, and, and they understand what the firm is about, what's taboo, like we talked about at the beginning, and what's not. Um, one, other, one other thing, a couple other things that I want to mention really quickly is, you know, uh, there, there's some easy programs that um, develop unity, right? And show folks that we have um, much more in common than that are different. And we, we developed a cookbook which we ask people to submit their, res their, 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 you know, their, their um, various recipes and what have you. So we could create a cookbook. Um, we have music sharing on Spotify. We open a Spotify account and people share their music. Um, you know, we have uh, kind of like a town hall meeting in various offices. Uh, and, and I just take it upon myself sometimes to what I call sharing beautiful things. Like if I see something that's amazing that somebody posted on LinkedIn or somewhere, you know, I will share it with the staff because these are the types of things that let people know that you're th it's more than just how much did you bill and how much money you're going to make for the for the company but we're thinking about you other things that we do is we celebrate you know themed months like you know black history month women's month lbgtq month you know ramadan hanukkah you know, these are the things. So that way, our staff uh, know that we seriously consider all the various cultures and whatnot that, that lie within the company and that we care about them.
there's a whole ton more I could tell you, but you know, um, I think it's almost that time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being a guest on Reimagining Company Culture. Uh, I enjoyed our conversation today. I, I certainly enjoyed our conversation and thank you for inviting me. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in both employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. And now it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care.